Perfect. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this in this event. You know, DMP online and DCC community is very special to me because it, I think it, this this is the community which is uh, here from the beginning. So whenever we talk about the DMPs, we talk always somehow uh, with relation to what DCC and what DMP online teams were doing. And in this uh, presentation today, I want to talk a little bit about the history of where we were 10 years ago, what we're going to do in the future, and also, of course, where we are right now. And before I start, just a few words about uh, me, because uh, maybe some of you don't know me, and I'm also having different roles. Uh, and I show this slide mostly because to show you that I have different uh, roles in the DMP community. So on the one hand, I am a chair of the LDA groups where we're trying to work with all the tool providers, not only DMP online, but also uh, other tools that I'm not going to name here. And we work on the alignment of standards and we try to bring the community together. On the other hand, I'm a senior researcher at the Faculty of, Inf of Informatics at Teuvin, where I'm a researcher that has to write uh, DMPs myself, but also part of my research is on how can we make DMPs better. And that's why the topic of machine actionable DMPs and topic of reproducibility comes into play. Uh, another hat that I'm wearing is the technical lead at the Center for Research Data Management of Teuvin. And this is a center that provides services to all other researchers of the university. So whenever they want to write a data management plan and they have questions, they come to our center. My role is to provide them a, a tool and a data repository. So basically to support them in creating uh, uh, the DMPs and in managing the, the data. And last but not least, I'm a technical lead for the EU funded OS Trails project, which is the project that has just started in February. And with other tool, uh, DMP tool platforms, we work, we work there on uh, better alignment of our technologies and on progressing the fields. Uh, and in this presentation, I will be trying to give perspective of, of what has happened in the past, where we are today and what's in the future. And I will try to take into account all these different hats that I am uh, wearing. So let's maybe start with, uh, with the past. And uh, it's already surprising to me that uh, I've been so long in this uh, field, more than 10 years, that I'm already able to give such talks. Uh, basically, 10 years ago, uh, or, or 12 years ago, I think this slide shows that this checklist is from 2013. We didn't have anything else than the DCC checklist for data management plan. And I'm using this quote from the, the ring of Lord of the Rings because all other checklists, all other uh, guidance I have seen in other countries around Europe, they are in some way inspired or copy pasted by this checklist made by DCC. As some of you may remember, the checklist made by DCC was an attempt to uh, put in one place different requirements of uh, local uh, funders in the UK on what they expect regarding data management plans into one place to create such kind of a comprehensive uh, list of what can be asked if you're writing a data management plan. And this was basically the, the, the big start for, for all the discussions around Europe uh, when it comes to data management. And DCC had a really great contribution there. And if we look also at the situation, I would say around 2010, 2012, so that's why I say roughly 10 years ago, very few funders mandated DMPs. So in the UK, it was a bit more advanced compared to, to other countries but they were mostly seen as optional thing. Uh, DCC uh, DMP checklist was a brand new document. So everything we had was a PDF with a list of questions. And then we had our text editors to, to answer some of the questions. Uh, very few data repositories existed at that point. Uh, we talked a lot about open access in around 2010. So open access to publications and in, universities and uh, research performing organizations were starting their own systems for collecting publications and providing access to them. 
but very few people were actually doing anything about the data. So digital preservation topic was a big uh, thing around that time. And for example, zenodo.org that now most of you are familiar with, didn't exist at that time. So it was just launched, I think 2014. Also the fair principles, which are now a core requirement for many data management plans. And also uh, if you look at the template from the uh, Horizon uh, Europe, the, from the European Commission, but in general, uh, if you look at anything we do regarding data management, we do most of the things to make things fair. Data management plans are one of the ways of explaining by researchers what will they do to comply with fair principles, even if it is not explicitly a uh, phrase like this in the template. Fair did not exist in 2014, 2010. Fair principles, the paper was published 2016. So that's why I'm showing you that 10 years is not that much and the landscape was completely different. Uh, based on that uh, observations, I allowed myself to draw this uh, hype cycle curve. You you may know this from Gartner reports about the uh, hype technology, about the hype in the in the IT when it comes to uh, showing which uh, technologies are raising stars. This is what you see on the left hand side of the of the plot. Which of the uh, technologies are on the main hype? So this is the peak of the curve. So what everyone keeps talking about, and then when the uh, curve goes down. This is the moment when people are like, ah, okay, we already have heard too much about this concept. We are becoming skeptical about it. And then the interest is going down, down, down. And then after some time, it starts going up, but slowly. This is the moment when uh, expectations are managed, when people understand what are the benefits and, 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 and disadvantages of a specific technology or a specific solution. And then this technology is used in these identified uh, cases. So if you look at how it could have looked like 10 years ago, because again, I did this uh, this uh, plot myself. <laughs> I think open access was was the was the hype term, uh, and DMPs, fair and machine actionability were just at the beginning of the conversation. And now I would like to jump a little bit to the. Uh, future uh, compared to 2010 uh, to IDCC uh, 17, so the uh, International Digital Curation Conference, which we had in the 2017, and then some other developments from uh, then, so basically from 2017 to 2020, uh, because a lot of uh, things happened regarding machine actionable data management plans. Uh, in At IDCC 2017, uh, we had a workshop where we talked about, you know, like many things don't work well in the DMPs. We should do something different about them. Uh, and we talked about integrating tools and services and, and making better uh, use of information that we already keep somewhere else. And we came up with a, with a report which was published in the Rio Journal that we need machine actionable data measurement plans. And in the same year, there was an RDA plenary in Barcelona and a force 11 meeting. At that time, RDA and Force 11 were like two organizations doing very similar things. They later went in different directions. But uh, at RDA, there was a decision to create a, a working group for uh, developing a, a standard for uh, machine actionable DMPs. And uh, during the development of the uh, specification, and I will say a few things about MA DMPs later in this presentation, we also made a lot of observations on what else we need apart from a common model of exchanging information between the tools and services. And all these observations were put into the 10 principles uh, paper. So 10 principles for machine actionable data measurement plans, which was published in 2019. And then in 2020 or 2019, uh, let's say December, uh, we also published the specification uh, on MA DMPs. But uh, back to the paper, because I think that the paper is, is more uh, relevant for the discussion of, of what happened within the, the last uh, few years in the community. In the paper, uh, we, we were trying to uh, explain to the broader audience, to all types of stakeholders, what this machine actionability really is. Because whenever we are starting a discussion, the first question is, is there any definition, what it really uh, uh, means? Also, the machine actionability was something that was brand new at that time because the fair principles 
that were published 2016, were using an exhaustive, ex extensive use of this term, and, and that was kind of the talk of the town. Uh, and in the paper, we summarized uh, what it really means, what has to be done. And you can see here um, the 10 principles on the right-hand side of the, of the screen. And uh, in the principles, since it's called principles, we try to outline uh, things that has to be addressed by the community, by different stakeholders. So not only researchers, not only funders, not only research performing organizations, to make this idea of interconnected systems, exchange information uh, to minimize the effort for the researchers and for everyone involved in this game, uh, to minimize the effort to make it easier for them. And um, the principles are not related to any technology, not related to any specific funder. Uh, they don't contain any guidance for researchers writing an additional DMP. So it's more kind of a contract uh, between all of us uh, to synchronize the efforts, uh, how can we uh, improve the situation? And I think I don't have time to go into all of the details of the of the principles, but if you look at them, uh, the first uh, two basically say that we need to integrate all stakeholders into the game. So writing the DMP is not just a responsibility of a researcher, but we must have systems that support them and must have systems that represent other stakeholders. So one example I always have, if the researcher needs to uh, assign a license and they don't know what license to use, there has to be some support from the institution to, to suggest the recommended license. This can be either a person, I know, uh, writing an email, but it's best if it's a system that uh, follows the um, follows the policy of the of the institution to recommend the default license. And of course, if you are in a house special, you can pick a, a different one. But if the policy of the institution is always use CC BY for data, then make this suggestion automatically to the researcher and allow the researcher just to accept the suggestion. And this uh, connects to the principles three and four so that we must have policies and must have regulations and we must have resources in our institutions that uh, can be understood by machines, not only by people. So if the policy is a PDF document saying use CC BY, we must have this information expressed in such a way way that machines can parse this information and depending on the specific case, make an automated suggestion to the user. Um, rules five and six talk about some specific technical technological challenges. So uh, again, at that time, the use of persistent identifiers, the PIDs and controlled vocabularies was still at the beginning. So all the big projects that popularized using PIDs uh, were not there yet. Uh, uh, so um, the principles say we must have, I know, DOIs, ORCIDs, ROARs, identifiers for instruments and so on available. We must have a common way of expressing information contained in the EMPs. So we cannot send PDFs around, but we must have some structure for, I know, of a JSON ontology, whatever that is. But basically the principles say community must agree on, on having some common way of talking about DMPs, independent of which tool you're using. And then we have the principles like seven and eight uh, that say that, uh, okay, you make things easy for machines to suggest, to automate, but don't forget about the people because people still have to read what's inside of the DMP. Don't forget about the funders and don't forget about those who uh, evaluate the DMPs because they still have to say and be able, still have to be able to say whether the given DMP is good or not good, whatever good means in this context. And uh, rules nine and 10 uh, suggest breaking the silo that, uh, you know, DMP is just my thing as a researcher and I'm not going to show it to anyone else. The rule number nine says, make the revisions frequently by getting the updates from different services, by automatically filling out the DMP. This information can be uh, uh, always, let's say, up to date and not created only once at the beginning and once at the end of the project. And also making the DMPs publicly available can help in the discovery of connections between people, projects, grants, um, basically uh, better understanding the context in which, for example, a given data set was uh, produced. So these are the 10 principles and these are the learnings we, we collected uh, from 2017, 2019. 
And now jumping to uh, 2024, we had a workshop also organized by IDCC uh, in February this year. I guess some of you were already uh, there. And uh, we discussed, uh, do these principles make sense? Do they hold? Is there anything that we should change? Or is there anything that we imagined five years ago that did not work out and, and, and should be changed? And there are some results uh, published already in the in Zenodo, uh, so we can see the the feedback, the raw let's say the raw data we got from the uh, participants. We are still in the process of writing uh, some kind of a summary, but uh, since I was there, I can tell that uh, it was surprisingly positive feedback that we said yes, as a community, we are doing good. We have implemented many of the things. We have the common standard. We have the PIDs. Uh, there has been a lot of changes in the DMP platforms. But of course, there are still some parts uh, that are missing. We are still not really making the DMPs uh, available and the integration of stakeholders, their use of information could always uh, be better. But in general, the, uh, the feedback was really, really nice. And I would like to thank you everyone who participated in the workshop. Uh, but now I, I've talked a lot about the the DMPs, MAD, especially MADMP, so machine actionable data measurement plans, and uh, maybe a few words to, don't, to those who don't know what it exactly is. So one of the rules, as you can see, the rule number six says that we must have a common uh, data model for MADMPs, and within the RDA um, Research Data Alliance, we have produced a recommendation which represents a consensus of a community how to uh, model this information. And uh, maybe I skip. This. And and basically, we said that if we have all these systems that are exchanging information between the stakeholders, so like you can see in this uh, figure, if you look in the middle, you have a typical process of writing a DMP. So you start with estimating size and type. This comes from the researcher, and then you have estimations on cost, storage, licenses, and then finally the submission to the funder. A lot of the information, the cost, storage, and license can be provided on behalf of other stakeholders if there are systems in place. To be able to implement such a workflow, we need to know the responsibilities. So who is actually uh, responsible at a given organization to provide information on costs of storage? Do you have a cost model? Yeah. Who can provide this legal ad advice? If this is clear, who does what and when, then we can put technological solution to orchestrate the exchange of information. But what we also need is to have a common way of talking about the things. So if this is, there is a DMP, we must represent specific uh, elements of a DMP in the same way. So here is a, a, a comparison between a traditional DMP and a machine actionable DMP. So what you can see above, this administrative data question answer, is something that the DMP online was producing around 2017, so to say. So it was modeling a question, and then there was basically an answer. It was impossible to write a simple query to find out who is the principal investigator, for example. And, and it was leaving also a lot of uh, open uh, questions. So, you know, Moritz from our university, we don't know what our university is. We don't know which Moritz. MADMPs focus on modeling the information and not questionnaires. And here you can see the same information or actually more showing that Moritz, Moritz is a data management manager, that he has a specific ORCID identifier and also a, an email address. So that was the big change. And the tools are still in the process of implementing the recommendation. So it's not like we switched everything overnight, but that was an agreement. We have to go in this direction. So let's talk about the facts and not try to represent what a given funder is asking. This is still needed, but it's part of the transition to, to make sure that we have the bits of information that other systems can reuse and other systems can provide. So what RDA produced is basically this long table, uh, which is not a questionnaire, not a template, and it is a technical specification, meaning that most of the fields are optional. And basically it says, if you talk about any of these things you can see here, so if you talk about, I know, a, a cost of a DMP, or if you talk about the contributors of a DMP, this is the terminolo terminology to use. So if you talk about it in this way, other tools, other services, repositories, whatever you have, will be able to understand what you're saying. 
part of the RDA uh, activity and kind of a condition to to make it a recommendation is the uh, is the implementation and adoption of the recommendation by the DMP tools. Here you can see uh, some of the adoptions we got. So DMP online, DMP tools, so the same family of uh, RD, uh, DMP roadmap. Also the the French version of DMP online, so DMP Opidor. Colleagues from Data Stewardship Wizards, uh, Open Argos, uh, RDMO in Germany, uh, DAMAP, which is the tool from uh, from Austria, and and some other um, uh, colleagues said, okay, let's start implementing the uh, MAD recommendation. Um, again, something that makes the MAD MPs different compared to the additional PDFs that you keep sending, but uh, as email attachments, is that. With MAD MPs, we wanted to provide glue between the systems. So here you can see an example we have from Austria that we try to pull information from funders, information on data sets from repositories like Zenodo or GitHub, from registries like Refree Data or Open Door, from the places where you can store the data you know, uh, during the research like OnCloud or, or GitLab. And also we use the authentication administration uh, information from local CRIS systems. So for example, information on people who are involved on the project, grant numbers, and so on. And that was the big change uh, compared to the DMPs that we had if, when we had the checklist from DCC. Because when we had the checklist, we had a long list of questions and the researcher had to basically type in all the answers. With the MADMPs, we said, let's connect all these systems together and let's stop asking people about the grant number, their affiliation, their email address and, and information, what is the node and whether it provides uh, PIDs. Answers to all these questions were already provided somewhere else. Let's integrate that. If you want to read more about uh, the DM MA DMPs, uh, you can see this uh, paper in which we describe uh, what we did as a working group and also some comments on how uh, different platforms plan on implementing that. And there are also two other papers in which we talk more about the uh, enterprise architecture for an institution. So if you want to change how you uh, do data management and if you want to integrate MA DMPs, you should read the one uh, on the left-hand side. And we also have one paper with ideas uh, from the hackathon we did. Uh, this is the paper on the on the right. Okay, but I talked a lot about the past, and and especially those who were witnessing the the past developments know it very well. But uh, where uh, are we today? So many things has have changed. I think you already kind of uh, see that. So that's why I also started with this DMP checklist so that you can see the, the progress of how much tooling we got. We have fair principles. We have lots of discussions of on, on machine actionability, arrow crates, data packaging. So it's not only machine actionability of DMPs, but also other types of digital objects. We have the RDA recommendation. DMPs are now a common requirement everywhere. So it's not specific to some local councils in, in, in UK, but every researcher in Europe understands the pain of, of writing a DMP. We have more tools to support researchers uh, and we have higher reuse of information due to much actionability, but it's not still the, the full reuse as we could imagine. And going back to our hype uh, curve, uh, so I think the People are already a bit tired with with uh, hearing about fair and, and machine actionability. That's why I put it already at the bottom of the of the curve. And I think now we, as a community, start getting into this aware discussion of what we can really make fair and what really machine actionability can be. I think the same is about the MADMPs. So when we published the recommendation, it was on the top of the of the hype, basically where the AI is, of course, given the, all the all the proportions. Uh, and now uh, discussion on MADMPs is becoming uh, more realistic of, okay, people understand what it is, the definition is known, and we are discussing more specific solutions. And that's also something I will touch on uh, when I will be talking about the future. And one thing that is, I think, uh, coming up next, which you can see in the left-hand side, on the left-hand side of the of the plot, is automated assessment. So. That's also part of the of the future discussions, but you know it doesn't come out of nowhere. So we can already hear from some funders that they would like to spend less effort on reviewing the DMPs. 
and maybe there are ways to automate it and if MAD and PIS are so great, maybe they could help with that. So this is still like not on the on the hype, but it's going up the up the curve. Um, with this slide, uh, I would like to show the anatomy of any DMP software because, of course, this is an event for the for the DMP online. But all of you know, and I think I don't have to hide the fact that there are also other DMP uh, uh, tools. But by the end of the day, they are all very uh, similar because what we have is the user on the left hand side who gets some sort of the user interface. Usually, it's a graphical user interface to interact with the tool. Uh, the tool itself has you know, a database and, and, and the tool usually exports uh, a document, which is a PDF document or a Word document. Of course, sometimes it exports the JSON file with the MADMP recommendation, but <clears throat> basically the flow is the same. You go, you click something, and then you get a, you download some document which you take and send it somewhere or upload it somewhere. And what the tools are doing right now is they are making calls to get the data from external sources. So they are they are connecting to information on projects and grants. So this is thanks to a lot of work which was done uh, to create uh, these registries. Uh, local funders are giving um, now DOIs or other identifiers to the to the grants, and they are not keeping this information closed, but they are making it publicly available. Uh, most of the tools talk to registries like referee data, fair sharing, uh, to get additional information on, for example, platforms or repositories where the data will be hosted. And tools also talk to scientific knowledge graphs, for example, or, sc or scholarly knowledge graphs without going into discussion on the, on the differences between those. So for example, tools talk to the open air knowledge graph to get some information on the data sets. Like for example, I want to reuse a data set and I type in the DOI in my DMP tool and then the tool automatically gets information on who is the author and uh, where it is located. And this is added to the DMP. And um, what you can also see in this, in, this, in, this, in this sketch is the API at the bottom. So the tools usually have some custom ways of get the information from the tool and uh, maybe modifying the tool. This is all, let's say, for geeks, for developers. But uh, instead of accessing the contents uh, for the user interface, there are some ways to manipulate the documents or, or maybe users through these APIs. But this is not standardized at all. And uh, here I, I, I'm showing exactly the same figure, but uh, with for three different tools. So you can see uh, on the right hand side the DMP tool from California Digital Library. So this is the the, the, the clone of of DMP Online. You can see Argos in the middle and and Dumb up on the left hand side. And all of them, for example, connect to different services to get information on the grants. So Dumb up connects to the local university quiz system. Argos always uses uses some kind of an open air service. Uh, guys in California are connecting to the NIH or NSF uh, uh, grant system. Again, this slide is only to show you that we all do basically the same things. It all depends on the local cast on the local uh, on the local uh, integrations and on the um, and the whole effort goes in in, in this direction. Um, when it comes to the MADMPs, because this is the main topic of my talks, basically, where are we with the MADMPs? Uh, all of the tools can export MADMPs, but the level of details uh, is different because some of the tools uh, talk about the uh, data sets in the, in the tool, like uh, they can tell that the DMP consists of 10 different data sets. Some of them pack them as one big data set. There are some implementation choices done, done by each tool, how they fill out specific uh, fields. Uh, and what is common for most of the tools, all of them, exporting an MADMP is a one-time activity, meaning the user clicks something in the tool and then says export. And then a JSON file with the MADMP is created, and that's it. It's not a continuous activity of adding something into the DMP by different services but it's rather a way to migrate information from the DMP tool into some uh, other place. Can we do better? Is this the, is this the maximum ability that, that we wanted? 
I think we can do better. And, and that's why I want to talk about the future. So you can disagree with everything I would say from now on. <laughs> Actually, you can also disagree with everything I, I have said before, but with the previous part of the conversation, I was trying to stick somehow to the facts. This one is basically what I would expect uh, to happen within the next 10 years. So I think we are on a good way to replace the data measurement plans with machine actionable data measurement plans. That's why I was showing in this hype cycle that we are we have already managed the expectations. We know what to expect and we are working on specific solutions. And DMP tools will become more DMP, MA DMP platforms. Why am I making this change in the semantics? Why am I changing the word tools to platforms? Because for me, the tool uh, belongs to the past. It's the traditional understanding of you working with the user interface to get some document out, to get a PDF out or to get a JSON out. So it can create you DMP or an MA DMP, but in this like kind of an old fashioned way. MA DMP platform to me, is a, is a system that can be accessed using an API that gets updates from other services and provides updates to other services. So this is this idea of making MADMP a living document. I will explain this a little bit more in the next slides. I think what we'll also get within the next few years are the automated indicators for MADMP quality. So if the uh, researcher is writing a data management plan, we can already guide the researcher. This is a good solution. This is maybe not so good solution. This will result in a, a higher fairness of your data. This will be the lower fairness of your data. And of course, we, it, we, it would not scale if every DMP would have to be consulted by some expert data steward or whatever the, the role is called. We need some automation here. And of course, I need to say AI. Yeah? AI is now in every, in every presentation. So this is this slide that talks about the AI. Uh, maybe we would be able to better profile the researchers and based on that, provide a better guidance. So I mean, a situation when you are, let's say a researcher in, uh, in uh, physics and by knowing your affiliation and knowing, for example, your past experiments, Maybe we are able to better suggest you which metadata standards you should follow, which uh, repositories for you will be a better fit. So, you know, instead of asking somebody to choose from a long list of options in, in Refri data, they, it would be narrowed down to, to a smaller a smaller choice. So this is where I would see the chance of using AI with MA DMPs. I don't think we want to turn uh, use AI to basically generate traditional DMPs. So I think the, the direction of uh, simply asking ChatGPT to write me a DMP that answers this question doesn't bring any value because nobody wants to read it uh, and it doesn't really model the information. And we made this agreement in the past that if you want to change the DMPs into something useful, we want to focus on modeling the information and not modeling the answers or the, or the questionnaires. But going back to the uh, this change from DMP tools to platforms. So instead of having uh, different uh, APIs, as I was showing before, it would be a good idea to have one common API for the DMP tools, that we could get the data from DMP tools and that we could modify the data in the DMP tools. So let's say the grant system could um, update parts of the DMP that are uh, about the funding. The repository service could update the parts of the DMP when a data set was uh, published. Um, maybe part of the DMP could be modified by a data steward using some user interface for, for humans. But uh, if we want to, to make this happen, we have to save costs because all the DMP tool providers have problems in finding the developers and, and, and funding the development. So if we could build integrations between the systems once only, so for example, integrating a DMP tool with Invenio uh, repository, all of the tool providers could benefit from that. And the way to benefit from that is to have a common way of accessing information in MA DMPs and having such, a, such an API. 
Uh, how can we make this work? Uh, this is to be discussed, uh, but we have to observe observe uh, also developments in other areas, not only uh, within the DMP domain. I have here a slide uh, showing uh, a specification of um, uh, scientific knowledge graphs and uh, the RDA MA DMP specification. So on the left hand side, you can see uh, an output of the RDA scientific knowledge graph uh, interoperability framework specification, which was produced by the respective working group at RDA. And without going into the details, it shows that knowledge graphs model information about the, about the grants, organizations, products, uh, persons, data sources, and so on. And if you look on what we have with the MA DMPs, we also talked about the projects, funding, costs, contact uh, for DMPs, data sets. So the terminology is not exactly the same, but you can see at the first glance that there are many overlaps. And maybe as a community, we have to make the standardization even a bit further and say, okay, if we see that information in SKGs and MADMPs is similar, let's talk about it in the same way, and then we can have the higher re reuse of information. And this brings me to the discussion about the so-called pathways. So what are the modern ways of, uh, of working, of doing science and of data management? Because we have the DMP tools, which are becoming these platforms. We have data repositories. We have scientific knowledge graphs. Uh, we will have some uh, maybe automated DMP evaluation and fair evaluators. Uh, we have like 35 different tools for evaluating fairness. How does this all fit together? So maybe uh, there are some uh, pathways or so some typical use cases that we as a community should explore together. One of them could be uh, seen from the perspective of a DMP tool. So maybe when creating a data management plan, uh, a researcher would search an SKG to look for records that he or she is reusing, get metadata from, from there, and maybe it would get um, information about the uh, fairness of what is actually being described in the, in the DMP. Uh, this is just an idea. This is just to stimulate the discussion on, on all of these uh, topics. But we have these new services in place and we have to think of how can we really make use of them because SKGs are not only useful for funders, they can be useful also for DMPs and similar to other uh, other parts of the, of the system. Uh, since I mentioned this DMP evaluation, a uh, few words about this. Uh, we have written a paper for the core data uh, journal, so you can look it up maybe, uh, evaluation of DMPs, and these figures come from this paper. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, three use cases of how DMPs are evaluated. So the, the first one on top, which is described as is, is what you have currently. So you have a researcher using some DMP software, for example, DMP online. They produce a text-based DMP, which is sent to the funding agency, and the reviewer looks at the PDF and says, good or bad. Uh, if we want to change the situation using the MA DMPs, I could see two generic scenarios, the 2B1, which is in the middle. So the researcher still uses some DMP software, but produces an, but produces an MA DMP. And this MA DMP is received by the DMP evaluation software at the site of the funding agency. And some of the information in the MA DMP have to be uh, presented in a systematic way to the reviewer. So we still need a human to read parts of the DMP. So kind of this part where we have explanations, but they are clearly, clearly annotated what this explanation is for. So is it an explanation for ethics, explanation for uh, long-term preservation or for choosing some standard or what, whatever? And then we can also have some automated assessment result. So we don't have to ask the reviewer, for example, to check with every DOI mentioned in the, in the DMP actually exists. So this could be a situation at the end of the project where you're saying what you did in your project. So we could automate this uh, link checking and, and checking, for example, if all these data sets have the uh, CC BY license assigned as it was uh, mandated by the funder. So this could be one scenario. The other scenario, which seems actually even more interesting, is this to be, to be two, which is at the bottom. So the DMP evaluation software 
runs at the side of the of the of the researcher. So when you're writing the DMP, when you're performing the action, this evaluation software tells you, okay, this is good, this makes sense, uh, this 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 makes you com um, compatible with the requirements of your funder and so on. And then at the end, the reviewer can get anything. They can get a DMP and they can check it themselves but they can also get an evaluation score saying that, yes, this DMP has been checked by the evaluation service and in general, it's okay. Or whatever the score is, this is still to be defined by the community. And on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see different goals of reviewing the DMP. And this is again, a discussion which we should have in the community. What does it mean to evaluate a DMP? So are we checking only if all the questions are answered? So this is this completeness. Or are we talking about also the feasibility? So does it make sense what was described in this DMP? So if somebody says, I'm going to put five petabytes of data on a floppy disk, you know, this makes no sense. But the question was answered. So this is what I mean with the feasibility. Then we can also look at the DMP uh, from the perspective of fair assessment of the data sets. So a DMP is good if the data described by the DMP is good. So if the data is fair, then the DMP uh, should get a positive evaluation. Maybe that's a way to go. And also we can also look from the compliance. So if the founder has some specific rules, which says you must do this, if the DMP is really, is really doing that. And this is again, a, an open question of how to model the requirements and, and what is actually compliance. And I think we are still not there as a community to, to answer what evaluation means and that's what that's one of the things i would like to invite you all for the discussion and i think a good place to have the discussion is the research data alliance so we have the rda active dmp's interest group and within this interest group we uh we have uh, meetings we had a meeting last week there will be one in the uh, in the autumn but we plan to have some uh, meetings in between because we want to discuss, discuss starting new working groups. So the common API for DMP tools, uh, this evaluation uh, requirements, maybe alignment with uh, knowledge graphs. This is on the table. And uh, if you have any interest, please uh, let us know. Please contact uh, any uh, of the chairs of the, of the interest group or just write to the mailing list if you have any ideas. Parts of these things that I have presented in the last two or three slides uh, are also a topic of the OS Trails project, the European funded project that I'm uh, uh, leading as a technical lead. So that's why uh, that's why I showed you some of the diagrams because we already put some ideas and some thinking into this direction. But to make this fly, we need the whole community. And this is not one project that will solve all, solve all of these things. We need your participation. So uh, that's basically it from my side. So uh, I think you can see that we walked a long way together as the community. We got many things right. So the 10 principles still hold as it was said in the last DCC uh, workshop. We have MA DMPs. We have DMP tools used across communities, but we still have a lot of things to do. So we need further standardization and alignment. We need to do something about DMP evaluation and maybe you also have some uh, other ideas. That's it from my side. Thank you very much for the invitation. And if you have any questions, anytime. Thank you, Tomasz. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. I enjoyed uh, how you look into the past, present, and the future. It was it was very inspiring. Um, we did receive a few questions in the chat. Um, one was from Teresa. Teresa, would you like to unmute yourself, maybe? Or I can read a question for you, if you don't. Um, I'm just trying to open the chat. Mm -hmm. Hi, Teresa. Thank you. Um, 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 I, Teresa, you're breaking up a little. Magdana, maybe you can read her question. Yeah, I'll, I'll was going to say, I was going to say, I'll, I'll, sorry, Teresa, I think the line is mm -hmm. breaking up a little. So I'll just read your questions. Um, Tomas, Teresa was asking, uh, can you please explain the third principle in more detail? Policies are usually not written in a way that machines can understand. 
They often contain recommendations and use a language that in many cases cannot be expressed in the form of yes, no decisions that machines can use to make decisions on some form of actions. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know this is a common, let's say, uh, problem. I know it also from other uh, domains, like let's say digital preservation that I mentioned. Uh, the role of the policy is to provide some high level a list of principles that we agree and let's say we believe on. And principles are used to, to derive the specific rules. So by making policies machine actionable, it doesn't really mean that we are turning the policy itself into something that machine can understand, but we have to derive the rules first and then make these rules machine actionable. So if the policy says we believe in open, you know, in open source software, then the rules must say, okay, what is this open source software? So what, what are the characteristics? Or if we say we must always provide this open license, what is the open license for data? What is the open license for software? So this is the, the work of turning policies into something machine actionable. Thank you so much. I, I hope that um, explains um, it for you, Theresa. We did have um, another question from uh, Diana Pilver uh, asking, in 10 years, will AI replace data stewards? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, everyone is afraid of that. I think it always depends. It's just the same situation as with the junior and, and senior software developers, for example. So I think the data stewards have such a versatile knowledge uh, that I think it will take some time with data stewards. So again, my favorite example with the with the with the licenses. I think yes, we can have a, a service that acts on behalf of a data steward and answers these tedious questions. Yes, you can use CC BY. Yes, it's fine for our university. But usually there are all other more complex types of problems, usually the legal slash technical problems and then you still need a human. So I wouldn't be worried. Thank you, Tomasz. Um, I think these are the comments from the chat, unless there was something in there. We are having the shared notes in the Google Drive. I'm not sure whether anybody was adding questions there as well. Um, let me see. No, I think these are just copied and pasted. Um, is anybody else in the room having a question for Tomas? Feel free to either unmute yourself or add a question into the notes. I think I can hear someone. Um... Maybe it's me. <laughs> Might be. Well, unless there are any any further questions, Tomas, um, thank you so much for your talk. It's been very inspiring and very interesting. I enjoyed the graph and um, I enjoyed the graph looking for the future as well, what it might be. And you're completely right. There is uh, currently the curve going up towards the discussions around the AI and the implications for the DMP. So um, a very enjoyable talk.